Hi, I'm Nature Chris. Today we're in Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve. We're going to be looking at and doing a guided tour of Winfield Mounds and the associated village. Now, I'm not just going to be talking about the archaeology and prehistory of this area. For me, this is personal. When I was 18 years old, I was assigned to do archaeological research on the collections from Winfield Mounds and its associated village that were done by Wheaton College in the 1970s. I hope to share with you my knowledge of the area, teach you about local plants, and hopefully give you a greater understanding and appreciation for prehistory. Within this mature oak hickory forest are the remains of the houses of the people who both occupied Winfield Mounds and interred their dead here. To understand the Havana Hopewell that lived here, we need to understand their subsistence methods. Now, these people were living through a variety of horticulture and gathering. When I say horticulture, what I mean is small-scale agriculture, that is to say back gardens and growing crops rather than large-scale farm production of corn like we see in the Mississippian period. The crops these people were growing include squash, quinopodium, which is a grain similar to modern quinoa, marsh elder, and also sunflower. Looking out into the forest around us, there is a variety of edible foods. And if you understand what to look for, this can be a really productive area for you. The trees such as black cherry, mulberry, walnut, hickory, wild grape, blackberry, and black raspberry all grow here in abundance. By gathering these and supplementing what they gained through horticulture, the people were able to survive and live quite comfortably. So, this is a little piece of flint, and I believe right next to it we have some prehistoric pottery. So now is as good a time as any to talk about archaeological ethics. Although I found this stuff while we were filming this, I'm not going to be keeping it. I'm going to be putting it back where I found it. This area is a park. It's to preserve the past and to preserve archaeology. And I don't have permission to be here. And I don't have part of any sort of archaeological plan that I'm doing research with. So in cases like this, it's always best to leave things where you find them. And I hope that my viewers will share a similar archaeological ethics, and if you come out and visit Winfield Mounds, you'll leave things as you found them. So where this pottery is broken, you can see that this is grit temper. And if you remember from our episode on the Langford tradition, this is very different grit temper. It's not black, it's just made out of sort of more local material, and they're not too preferential on what types of grit they use in it. You get a couple of interesting styles of Havana Hopewell pottery, and we'll put some up on the screen. One of my favorites, which we do have some pieces of from the site, is called the Picasso pot, or it's Havana Zone pottery. This pottery has these Picasso-like images of birds and humans on them in zoned areas where the image itself is stippled in with stamping that kind of looks like teeth marks. So right now, I'm standing in the doorway of a prehistoric house. And you're probably asking yourself, how do you, Chris, how do you know that this is a prehistoric house? Well, the answer is, in 2012, I was part of leading a magnetometry survey of this area. Magnetometry is a technology that archaeologists use to measure variations in the Earth's magnetic field. When we map out these variations in the Earth's magnetic field, we can note anomalies that are caused by human behavior. For example, if you have a fire, the heat from that fire will, will take iron in the soil and realign it to magnetic north. If you dig a pit and you fill it with refuse, that pit will have a different magnetic signature than the surrounding area. When we looked at the data, right here where I'm standing, there is a pronounced square with a number of pits right in front of it. This corresponds very well 
to a denser scatter of prehistoric ceramics and lithics on the surface. The one thing that ties the occupants of Winfield Mounds to the broader Hopewell Exchange sphere is their lithics. Now, while there aren't exotic, extremely exotic ones like obsidian or materials like copper, we do see materials like kaolin and also burlington at this site. And this implies trade from southern Illinois all the way up to here. And this trade would have moved up the Illinois River Valley and bringing with it ideas and culture as well. The people at Winfield Mounds were not alone. They were connected by water to the other members of the Hopewell community. A couple miles up the creek is another decent sized Hopewell site called the Cot site. Their pottery is similar to the occupants here and their spear points are as well for many, although some extend later in time. Based on this, we can look at the interactions between people and one of the most important interactions among the Hopewell was their trade. These rivers formed the highways that people brought material for thousands of miles. Objects like obsidian from Yellowstone, conch shells from the Gulf of Mexico, and copper from Wisconsin all appear in Hopewell sites within Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. This is the location of Wheaton College's 1975 through 1978 excavations at Winfield Mounds. It was done to understand the surrounding village and basically broader landscape of the mounds themselves. Right below my feet, you'll note this Y in the path. This is what they call the Y grid. And this is where the densest cluster of artifacts came from. About 3,000 pieces of prehistoric pottery were found from here. The styles that were identifiable were primarily Havana dentate stamped. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this pottery when we look at it is it was all broken in ways that are consistent with misfiring. It looks as if the pottery was fired while it was still wet, uh, based on my own sort of experimental takes, and then it was discarded here. So this gives us a good indication the actual production of pottery was going on right beneath my feet. Now if you look out into landscape, just to the south of me, there's actually another site here that's sort of superimposed onto our Havana Hopewell site. There's a late woodland occupation with triangular arrow points and pottery that's more similar to the Albi phase right over here. As we move down this way, we have more Havana Hopewell stuff, and these two groups, while not overlapping chronologically, did overlap spatially. Behind me is the largest mound in the Winfield Mounds group, also known as the Player Mounds group. It was first dug into in the mid-1920s by a group of amateurs who were looting the mound. No one's really quite sure what they found, although some of the rumors say it was a person buried on a cape of beads. When these rumors reached the University of Chicago in 1931, Newman, a professor there at the time, brought a group of students down here to do an excavation of the mounds. What they found was a single pottery shard and a secondary burial. When I talk about a secondary burial or a bundle burial, what I mean is a human that's been allowed to deflesh and decay and then their bones are bundled up and placed in a burial. This is generally a sign that people have cared for the dead enough to come back for them. And we can think of these mounds as a sacred place. There weren't many artifacts of domestic life here. We don't see tons of flint. We don't see tons of broken pottery because this is not a place for the living. This is a place for the dead. Behind me, there are two mounds of the three mounds in the player mound group. One over here, one over here. These mounds have been nearly leveled through the excavations that have occurred over the years. Both the looters, the University of Chicago, and Wheaton College's excavations of a T-shaped trench in 1975. Wheaton College's excavation uncovered human rib bones, which have not been published. Now it is worth noting that these mounds that we do see, particularly the tallest mound, have been partially reconstructed as an effort done in 1999 to sort of restore the former glory and grace of this group and to restore some of the dignity of the people here trying to commemorate and memorialize their ancestors. 